Hey, welcome to a very special episode. Can a beginning to a video get any more impactful than this? I mean, look at this. I am surrounded by Nissan race cars and production cars of every possible generation. I am, of course, at the Nissan Heritage Collection uh, just outside Atsugi. And today we are going to be wandering around Nissan Paradise. I think the best way to approach this is to, you know, just start from the production cars and uh, begin at the very beginning. So the oldest car I can find, that's where I'll start. So I'm actually walking past the whole section of race cars, R33 LMs over there, the actual homologation car. Exciting stuff. But before we go there, let's start at the very beginning. So we can kind of run through Nissan's uh, history, where it all started, how Datsun came to be how Prince came to be and how it all merged to become Nissan. The variety of cars that they actually started working with. I mean, it's too many cars to obviously uh, cover one by one. So I'll probably do sections and uh, kind of highlight the things that stand out the most. Okay, so we start right here with the Datsun 12 Phaeton. So anything with a Phaeton uh, name in Datsun's lineup means that it's a convertible. So the roof kind of folds back and um, creates a drop top uh, version as opposed to a coupe like we have here. And uh, basically in Japan, before the 1920s, uh, nothing really happened with the whole auto industry. While the rest of the West was well in its way to kind of uh, putting people on wheels and, you know, Ford doing the Model T and getting people uh, mobilized in Japan, that kind of happened probably two decades after most of the Western world. And Nissan, or sorry, uh, Datsun, was pretty much where it all began. This is a good example, the Datsun 12 Phaeton from 1933. And this is the whole entire lineup going right through the 30s up until the Datsun 17, as you can see here, the Phaeton version and then the hardtop version. So these are the cars that really started mobilizing Japan, giving uh, slightly wealthier people the ability to get around and travel. And uh, so these Datsun 17s were very well known for being economical, easy on gas and consumption. And of course, they could fit five people easily, even though they're very very small looking cars in, by today's standards so as we progress to uh, the late 40s this uh, particular car here the Tama uh, was uh, one of I guess Nissan's first EV cars this is before Nissan was Nissan and before Prince even so we quickly move to post-war here this is the Datsun Sports uh, this is where um, I guess the Japanese automotive industry started to really kick off so the the Datsun lineup is a vast one and on this side too, there's a lot of little cars, station wagons and trucks that have kind of brought through the late 40s into the late 50s. One in particular that really stood out, of course, is the Prince Skyline. This was the very first one here. So yeah, 1957 saw the beginning of the Prince Skyline. This is the Deluxe, the Alcid-1, came with a 1.5 liter engine and that's where the Skyline name began. As we move along, you can see there's also a station wagon version of the Skyline. And then we move to a very important one. This is the BL RA3. This is the Prince Skyline Sports Coupe. So what makes the Prince Skyline Sports Coupe quite interesting is that, first of all, it was designed by Michelotto in Italy, and it was actually like a big boost in performance. So it's going from kind of run-of-the-mill sedan over into a luxurious coupe and you know a bit more power close to 100 horsepower and the lines are pretty killer really upped the design front and back and of course this is a very expensive car for the time they didn't sell or make too many of these but it's where the skyline went a little bit up market and then we move on to the next iteration of the skyline the 2000 gt from 1965 this is the s64b we actually see a bunch of these show up at uh, Daikoku events. This is again a bump up in power, 125 horsepower. So it's funny that we actually see a station wagon here kicking off the lineup. Next to it is the red 
Akoska four-door that was at Nismo Festival earlier in December. This is the VC10, so still a C10 generation Hako, but station wagon, extremely rare and very unique looking next to you know the usual GTRs that we see. These, of course, are all S20 powered cars. The generation continues over to the coupe. This came in 1969, so PGC10 Skyline. And then, of course, over to the 2000 GTX. So the trim level right below the GTR. A lot of these cars have been converted over the years uh, to look like GTR. So that's why I'm always wary when I see one at Daikoku. I always try to hear for that very unique S20 engine note. On the opposite lineup here, we've actually just walked past the entire Bluebird lineup how it all evolved right until a car that really still makes a lot of sense for us today, the 1965 510. So this is a four door. We have a coupe here in that mustard color that is uh, very rare and cool looking. And then of course the 510 wagon W510. And then the fair lady lineup begins starting off with this 1961 SPL 213, the very first Datsun Fair Lady. You can see the Fair Lady badge on the side. And that really didn't kind of translate into the export market until this particular car came out. This is the SP310, the Datsun Sport, if you come from markets like the US. And kind of what really kicked off the love for the Fair Lady and the Datsun brand. So the evolutions uh, pretty much went all the way up to the 2000 model. We have one here in white for the US market, another one here until we arrive at the PS30, the S30 Fair Lady Z. Of course, this is the epitome of this model. As you can see here on the side, this is the 432. So it's actually powered by the S20 that was in the Skyline GTR. So this is the million dollar s30 these cars are swapping hands for insane amount of money these days didn't want to skip through the cedric lineup i just felt like i should go back and show you guys how it all evolved all the way up to the president this is the v8 powered nissan president that came out in 1968 and it had 180 horsepower four liter overhead cam v8 so definitely very much inspired from US cars of the same era. And it's absolutely gigantic. If you compare it to pretty much any other car here, be it Datsuns, Skylines, and Glorious. the Gloria Cedric. So the Cedric lineup continues up until we hit the Gloria here, which featured very different headlight configuration for 1969. And we move all the way back here and instantly I find another very rare pairing. Of course, this is the very first Nissan Silvia. Here we are in 1966. The very first Silvia generation, the CSP311. Again, extremely valuable car, very, very few were made. And uh, it was the first time that the Silvia name was rolled out. Apparently from the information there on the floor, it's uh, from Greek mytholo mythology, if you ever wondered. So learn something new every day. Right here we have the Datsun Sunny generations, the coupes, the wagons, and of course the Sunny truck, which everybody knows and loves this came out in 1966 in its first iteration as a datsun sunny 1000 pickup you can see how it all evolved and got bigger this is a 1400 in its various guises until we get to one of my favorite nissan cars from back in the day the 1968 laurel so 1968 is when the four-door sedan came out 1972 is when the C130 Butaketsu Laurel came out, the coupe with the pig's butt, big 
fat rear end, uh, which kind of remains a must-have car if you're into the Kyusha movement. And that kind of progressed into the two-door hardtop 1979. This is the C231. They kind of lost that rear end design, unfortunately. Actually, speaking of rear end, we probably should go and have a look at the back. You see what I mean? That rear end is just unbelievable, especially if you drop this car on tiny little vintage rims. You have a Kyusha goodness right here. I'm gonna go right back to the very first Sylvia to begin the next lineup here. We just looked at this part, now we're at the 1970 P10 Cherry X1 four-door sedan. See the evolution of the Cherry. Then of course, the Violet hardtop came out in 1973, the KP718, 710, sorry, and the new Sylvia. So this is the S10 generation, a very cool coupe, extremely rare. And if you see, see it at the back here, you understand what it looks like. Again, you just do not see these cars out on the street these days as you do with the Nissan Violet. These are the other Cherry generations, four-door Violet 1600 SSS. So as we progress across a few more Bluebirds, we end up at another favorite of mine. This is the KPGC 110 1973 Skyline 2000 GTR, the Ken Mary. We just have to go around this car because this is by far my favorite generation of that first gen Skyline GTR. It has that kind of Mustang fastback look about it. It's the biggest of the GTRs. Beautiful thing and always a treat to see them on display. Of course it came with fender flares, steel wheels. Again, another million dollar car right there. Here we have a couple of S30s, 1970 ZL, the legendary 1972 HS30 police car, so cool. And then of course we move into the ZG nose. This is the 240 ZG USDM car in that classic maroon. And the Z selection progresses here as we go into the S130 hardtop. So this actually has a T-top, sorry. This is a removable panels on the, on the roof. The same with the Z31 next to it. This is actually the 50th anniversary version of Z31. So it has the gold pinstriping and two-tone that run across the lower section of the car. And it's got that uh, gold highlight on the wheels. This is actually a Canadian spec car. Next to the Ken Mary is the C111 Skyline hardtop. This is the GTX E. And then we go into uh, a couple of generations of the Nissan Cedric, starting with the 230 from 1972 and onto the 332 from 1978. Then we go into the patrol section or safari, depending where you're from. This is so cool. I'm a big fan of the safari patrol. Such a tough looking vehicle with those over fenders built in. Really tough looking thing. And as you know, they do crazy things with these um, trucks in the Middle East. get right back where we left off with the 50th anniversary Z31. Right, of course, can't forget the March, the Micra, which spawned interesting cars from the early 90s, like the BE1. This, of course, was built on a March platform, as, of course, was the PAL, and then the Figaro. Those kind of quirky cars from the early 90s that I think really injected so much flavor into uh, Nissan's lineup. I always felt that, you know, after these cars came to be, um, Nissan left behind a bit of something special, you know, that kind of will to kind of experiment with designs and do something fun. And, you know, it proved to be very uh, popular. To this day, these cars are collectibles. So maybe something to think about for the future. If you played the first few generations of Gran Turismo, you would remember the Nissan S-Cargo. Really funky design delivery van made by Pike Factory, which are the same people that made the PAL. Let's see if we can take a look at the back. I used to remember seeing these in the early 90s in Japan. They were used by flower shops to deliver plants. As you can see, it's a very tall van, so you can get a lot of stuff in the back and tons of space back there. 
So let's get right back into the Silvia lineup, starting with this 1982 S110 onto 1983 RS12. Started going for a slightly more hatchback look. And then of course, we go into the magic era here, starting with the S13, which came out in 1988. This is a Q's edition, automatic. Let's take a look at the back. So clean. We go over to the 180, the S14, and the S15 Varietta. We'll definitely need to go take a look at the front of this legendary lineup of Nissan sports cars that no longer exist. They had their chance back in 2013 with the IDX to kind of bring the spirit of the Silvia back, but Nissan really didn't bite the bullet back then. It's a pity because it would have come before the Toyota 86 and probably stolen kind of a lot of that market, but um, it never happened, unfortunately. interesting one this is a 1989 EB12 Sunny RZ1 twin cam Nismo so this is one of the very first times that we actually saw a Nismo logo appear on a Nissan production car you can see it's spelled out there Nissan Motorsport International so this was following the popularity of the four-door version of the Sunny and they decided to create the RZ1 a two-door kind of hatchback design with the CA 16 DE, very edgy, very angular 80s design. Of course, another popular name in Nissan's heritage is the Pulsar, which came in a bunch of generations, but this is one of my favorite. Again, we're talking late 80s, early 90s design, kind of like experimentation here. This is the Nissan Exa Canopy Type B, which has that ridiculously weird rear end. So it's kind of like a shooting brake. Look at the window layout here. And we actually saw this at Oktama back in summertime. So they're still around. They're still like prized possessions for cars that appreciated that kind of era. A kind of reminder that, you know, sometimes playing around with designs and doing something crazy always ends up working. intermission here from the lineup some fun one-offs here a lot of these cars i'm not really sure what they were used for this is a takashimaya kind of looks like a pope mobile version of the first gen um, leaf police leaf old v35 skyline pace car of course a nissan cedric taxi from back in the day it's got the old jcb logo this is from 1996 and a couple of other commercial vehicles, ambulances and buses and fire trucks. Next to that is the cars that were actually at Nismo festivals and have just been dropped off. So these cars ended up being driven. So they're waiting in this hold area, starting off with the R35 Super GT, going on to the Z33 and the Pitwork Motul R34 next to another Z33. So basically all these cars ended up getting driven pretty hard at Nismo festival. So once they're being dropped off here uh, by Safari Motors, they stay here until uh, the guys that look after the collections are able to bring them to the maintenance area and strip them down and kind of just run through everything just to make sure that they're in working order, oil changes, everything that needs to be done. But how incredible it is to be allowed to have some private time with cars like this. This is no joke, a dream come reality for me. Be such a hard fan, hardcore fan of the Skyline GTR, being able to get this close to the legends. Now, of course, we know that this generation of the R34 race car that has this kind of curvature around the fender is the one that dropped the RB26 in favor of the turbocharged VQ30. So again, this is the very last R34 GT500 race car from 2003. So I already dropped the RB26 for the VQ30 DETT, and after that, the Z33 took over.
but let's get back to the regular production cars. There's another hefty lineup to get through. So we start here at the very beginning, 1979, and we'll just call this a 1980s lineup. So starting off with a 211 and a couple of minor change versions that came after that in 1980, all the way to the HR30 in 1981. So a big jump in design. It started getting a lot more aggressive, a lot more sporty. And of course, uh, the coupes started becoming very popular. This is a KDR30, Skyline Hardtop 2000 Turbo RS. This is the performance version until we get to the Skyline Sedan RSX. As you can see, the face changed. So basically from this version of the DR30, we went over to this one with the smaller lights and that metal iron mask, as it was called face, the tick come in, and it gave a whole different feel to the car, almost making it a little bit more sporty, a little bit more aerodynamic, and quite a lot more aggressive. That, of course, led to the HR31. This is the 2000 GTSR that was at Nismo Festival. This, again, is pretty much the continuation of that bump in sportiness that led to the Skyline almost becoming a GTR, but not quite. So if we go to the back here, we see that they did not want to use just the GTR badge, but they added an S because they felt that it didn't really bring a whole lot of you know performance and innovation to the table as the Skyline GTR always did. For that, of course, we had to wait until the R32. So of course, before we actually got to the R32 GTR, there was this. This is a very special car. This is the mid four version two. So this is kind of like a prototype, a design phase, a, a study of technologies. Uh, it was a mid engined twin turbo, four wheel drive, four wheel steering performance car that kind of ended up fueling a lot of its uh, technologies to the Z32 Fairlady, but it also was a test bed for a lot of technologies that ended up in the R34, sorry, in the R32 GTR. This is a GTST, by the way, GTR is over there. And of course, this was a mid-engine car. This is a VG30 DETT under there. Bit of a pity it was never made, but basically, you know, in 1987, this was Nix Nissan kind of flexing, showing what it was concentrating on technology-wise, what was brewing, and then eventually became the R32 GTR. So from the R32 onwards, the lineup gets a little bit mixed up. There's a lot of uh, Laurels here, various generations, very cool cars. I particularly like this one here. This is a Leopard 1982 F30, the very first Infiniti M30 in the US. This, again, another late 80s car that was just laden with technology. And precisely the reason that these cars fetch a lot of money in today's market, there is a very big following cars like this and we'll probably end up seeing a lot at the nostalgic two days in uh, late february next year so hold on for that because we'll have definitely more to say about the leopard trying to follow the right order here we go of course to the r33 generation this was the otec uh, 40th anniversary version four door which followed the unveil of the r33 gtr in 1995 this is actually a 1997 model and then we move on to the R34, which came out in 1998 in ER format. So four door and two door. And then of course, 1999, the release of the R34. This is actually a V-Spec 2 from 2000, which of course came with the carbon fiber hood with integrated NACA duct feeding the turbos all the way to the very end. This is a M-Spec NUR, the end of the R34 production, August 2002 where basically they had a bunch of N1 engines left over and decided to do a limited run of a thousand units. It was 750 V-Spec 2 NURs and 250 M-Spec NURs, if my memory serves me correct. And of course, the Stagia 
Boltec version 260 RS should be in between the 34 and the 33s. This of course was running R33 GTR uh, driveline, the WGN C34 Stagia, which always confused me. I never really understood why it had a 34 in its chassis code, seeing it was mainly based on a 33. All right, so I came at the very bottom here of this lineup next to an awesome poster of a flame spitting racing skyline. So we've got a bunch of other cars to finish up with and definitely need to kind of show the March K11, uh, a car that did pretty well for Nissan uh, globally, especially in Europe. Next to it, a 2000 Cube, which kind of started that funky design era of the early 2000s. It kind of then spawned that asymmetrical design, uh, which I haven't seen yet in this lineup. Over here, we have a 1997 Safari, the last generations uh, that were sold in Japan. Of course, the Patrol is no longer available in Japan. Uh, next to it, we have the first Serena, the kind of beginning of the van era for Nissan in 1993. Of course, at that time, it was the Astro van that was imported into Japan. And all of a sudden, they had this massive boom with Astro vans. And then, of course, Japanese manufacturers took notice of that. And that kind of sparked off uh, kind of a race to get a bunch of vans out there. And that's why pretty much every manufacturer ended up having their own version of some form of uh, van. Next to it, another very cool car. Bizarre design, this on Rasheen. So this car actually came, uh, one version was powered by an SR20DET, transversely mounted which kind of brings you to the Sunny Pulsar GTIR, which had the same running gear. Interesting cars. There's another cool one. This is a 1990 FB13 Sunny NX Coupe. Funky design. I actually remember seeing a bunch of these in the early 90s when I first moved to Japan. They disappeared quickly, and you kind of do wonder where the hell they ended up going. Another funky one, the convertible hardtop version of the March. As we move along, we have, of course, the Nissan SEMA and President. So back in the 90s, early 90s, you know, everybody was about sedans. Everybody loved their big sedans and these massive cars kind of fought against the German S classes and E classes at the time. This is the very last version of the SEMA that was released in 2001, the F50, which of course was sold in the US as the Infiniti Q45. Another cool one here, of course, is the Sephiro, the A31 from 1988, so another RB powered car. Okay, so let's call that the end of the production car area, which was very vast. Now we move on to the fun stuff, the race cars. start things off with the Sakura. So this was a nickname given to this Datsun that uh, back in, what was it, 1958, did the round Australia trip, the Mobile Gas Tour of Australia, 16,000 kilometers, ended up coming 25th overall. You can see it's been left in its battered state. And the important thing about this car is one for Nissan, it kind of showed the reliability of Datsun uh, globally. It was, uh, you know, uh, a big deal to finish the race in one piece. That kind of boosted the image of Datsun. But for me especially, back in 2012, we filmed this car as part of my very first TV documentary that I did for Discovery. It was called Retro Car Kings, over 10 years ago now. But this car featured heavily on that. 
We actually drove it around this uh, warehouse. And if you can find that, have a look at it. It's still pretty cool to this day. Uh, did feature RWB and a bunch of other cool shops in it. So take a look at that if you can. As we move past some uh, Rally Bluebirds, we get into the S30 1973 African Safari Rally car. Again, another car that's been left and it's very battered state, missing body panels and crashed here and there. And then the Rally car lineup starts getting very cool as you get into the 80s this is an early 80s uh, 240rs sylvia so the cool thing about this car is that they actually made a homologation car for the 240rs and we saw one of them at the octama meet back in summer so really cool to be seeing the rally version of the car with the uh, legendary nissan datsun uh, motorsport colors z31 300ZX from 1983. So this was actually raced in the Japanese Rally Championship of 85. We keep going, we find a Pulsar GTIR. This was actually a car that participated in the RAC Rally in the UK. And then we move on to a 2004 Dakar Rally. This was actually a custom uh, pickup that was built for that crazy rally. You can see it has a very bizarre rear end. Pretty awesome. Next to it, the all gold R35 GTR. So this is the Usain Bolt special. I forget what year this is. I think it's 2012. And it still has the number plate there. From the same era, this is the 2013 Nissan Nismo N package, N attack package development car that was raced at the Nürburgring. As you can see, it still has the German number plate from Nissan Technical Center there and it's livery very cool to be seeing this car at scale kept so that kind of spawned off the aero package that included the spoiler and this very cool uh spoiler front fender which is very hard to film with this camel it kind of disappears but you can kind of make it out there then move on to personally what is my favorite generation of race cars the silhouette formula group 4 racing was absolutely wild in every form this is basically motorsport without much in terms of regulations wide bodies crazy wheel setup so staggered 19 inch at the back 18s at the front and uh, pretty much experimental turbo engines kicking out 600 plus horsepower probably more in qualifying trim and uh, it kind of brings legendary names like Central 20 into the picture here. So the really cool thing about these super silhouette formula cars uh, like the Bluebird, the Sylvia and the K10 March is of course that um, they kind of spawned off the Kaido Racer Gurachan movement where uh, people were kind of emulating these very angular over fendered body uh, race cars for the street and that gave uh, people a chance to kind of experiment with really funky styles that you know at least still exist to some part today it's a bit harder to find the meets of those cars these days but uh, you can imagine you know seeing these cars back in the day racing you wanted to have a piece of that so you would take your uh, sylvia or whatever and give them these crazy wide body conversions Look at the Hoshino racing wheels. Oh, that's so sick. Just casually walk past the Super Taiku 34 here to get a look at the back of these Super Silhouette Formula cars. This is actually um, a car that was driven by Kondo-san. So Masahiko Kondo, Kondo Racing now. He's a team principal. And just look at this rear section of the Bluebird. And of course, this is the car, the Hoshino Silvia that gave Katosan a Liberty Walk the inspiration to create that crazy wide body conversion for the S15 Sylvia that we've seen in Japan and Indonesia so far.
from group four, we go right into craziness. So this is an IMSA Lola that raced in the US, but specifically it's the group C era here of Nissan that really kind of emphasized just how much importance Nissan was putting into motorsport in that 80s era. And it all kind of culminates to this moment here, the R85V, this is a 1985 Group C race car and Nissan's very first entry into Le Mans. V6 twin turbo power, 680 horsepower declared, but probably closer to a thousand in qualifying boost and what a sight it is. That progressed over into 1986 with again a V6 powered VG30 prototype that looks completely different to the car that came before it over here and that led into the craziness of the V8 twin turbo era starting in 1988 with the R88C. This is a crazy thing. So 780 horsepower, three liter V8 twin turbo. And can you just imagine the downforce this thing generated? It all progressed into 1989 with the R89C. Again, power is pushed to 800 here, but you can just imagine what a flick of a boost over boost button would do to these things. Probably 1200 horsepower anytime that the driver kind of wanted. We go into the R90 CP from 1990. This was pumped to 3.5 liters. So again, a V8 around the 800 horsepower mark. 19, this is the 1991 R91 CP. So this is actually a car that participated in the Daytona 1992 race and ended up winning it. So slight different regulations, uh, slightly less power, 680 horsepower, but uh, insane looking things. We move on to the 1992 R91CP. This is an extremely successful car for Nissan. They actually won the driver and manufacturer championship that year uh, with Hoshino and Suzuki driving. And again, the Calsonic Nissan Motorsport livery. So the reason this NP35 1992 race car has no livery is because uh, it marked the change of regulations for Group C. No more turbocharged engines like the cars that came before it, but everything had to move to NA. And this car was only raced once in the Japan series and it ran a naturally aspirated V12 3.5 liter, kicking out 630 horsepower. And I actually have heard this car at Nismo Fest, so it sounds absolutely incredible. Imagine Zonda Revolution on crack. And from Group C, we move straight back into Le Mans, this time GT1, and the golden era of uh, GT1, because of course they required homologation versions to be made to register the R390 GT1. They had to do the road version of it. Again, if you're an avid Gran Turismo player, you may remember this car from, what was it, Gran Turismo 2 or 3? This was what needed to be built to homologate the race car. <laughs> it's absolutely wild. Crazy that we get to see this up close and personal. There's the badging R390 GT1, two exhausts on each corner. And that of course allowed this car over here to be homologated. And since I'm back here, I think I should do a quick pass of the back of these Group C race cars. An amazing generation of motorsport that unfortunately we will never really see again. But you know, a big up to Nissan Nismo for always bringing out these cars every year at Nismo Festival. Of course, you know, they have so many, they can't bring them out all of the time, so they're on a rotation. Sometimes you get to see Group C racers, sometimes you don't. But the important thing is that people are able to hear them and see them in action and uh, enjoy that experience.
next to the R390 GT1 race car. The first version of it, as you can see, the tail is a little bit different, has the longer version of that tail. And of course, in 1999, Nissan's Le Mans participation ended with the R391, which was part of the LMP class with drivers like Eric Comas and Motoyama and Kageyama taking the wheel. Of course, um, Eric Comas and Motoyama had a massive success in Japan in Super GT there. It was actually called JGTC back then. In the GT500 class with the Penzo cars in 98, 99, they took home victories. So unfortunately, this car didn't have uh, the best of successes. Two cars were actually raced in Le Mans in 1999, but um, one ended up crashing qualifying. The other never really finished past maybe 10 or something laps. Uh, but they did have a race in uh, Fuji the 1,000 uh, kilometer of Fuji, which they did pretty well, um, at least bringing one victory for Nissan for this LMP chassis. And of course, this is actually the uh, reason that the GTSR was made. So the road version of the R31 GTSR uh, had to be made in 800 examples so that this race car could be raced in the Japan Touring Car Championship back in 1990. Uh, 1989 sorry so uh, legendary car with a Reebok livery built and raced by Hasemi Motorsport and then the progression of Group A machines from the golden era of JTC starting with the Zexel the Tyson and the Calsonic R32 GTRs these are as legendary as legends get absolutely amazing to be standing in front of these three very special machines. Of course, these all ran RB26s, 600 plus horsepower. Again, little boost, uh, over boost button for qualifying. But uh, I think what really stood out the most for me is that they pretty much were stock bodied. I mean, nothing really changed uh, from that move from, you know, street going car to race car, except obviously the massive slicks and the racing mirrors and the roll cage. Yeah, I'm moving around here because I think I should go with the R33s first. And again, we go back to Le Mans. These are the three cars that made Le Mans possible in the mid 90s for Nissan. Uh, starting off with, of course, GTR LM homologation car. So this 1995 rear wheel drive only version of the R33 had to be made so that this car and then the following year, this car could be raced in Le Mans. So for the very first year that the wide-bodied LM version of the 33 raced at Le Mans, they actually were uh, running an N1-based version of the RB26, so 2.6 liter, just over that, 450 horsepower declared, and they actually managed to come fifth in their class and tenth overall. So it was actually a pretty successful first outing for the GTR at Le Mans. For the next year, they uh, kind of evolved the engine, so pushing it to RB28. So 2.8 liter capacity, more power, uh, about 600 horsepower. And they did a pretty decent result, 15th overall, 10th in class. Didn't really match that first year outing, but still, uh, at least finishing the race is just as much as an achievement as actually you know placing well so three incredibly legendary cars which we will have to go to the back and get a rear view look of because they are so wide and aggressive so there it is the homologation lm no it is not a wise sports wide body kit it is a factory spec wide body and it came with those nismo wheels with the blue barrel Look at the sidestep on this. All functional, of course, because there was a massive intake there for the brakes. And we can actually get a look inside. God, I never noticed this uh, seat trim on the Nismo Recaros. That is sick. Right at the back as well. Nismo steering wheel. And that's pretty much it, except for the fact, of course, that this is a rear wheel drive car. Next to it the two race cars you can see some slight differences here this has a louvered exit on the venting and the bumper 
exhaust tucked inside there. Some NACA ducts on the trunk. And for the later year, the ducting has changed a little bit. There's also a NACA duct feeding the rear fenders. And surprisingly enough, the spoiler designs are pretty basic. I mean, there's nothing crazy about this wing at all. So they just pretty much relied on mechanical grip for the most part. Side exit exhaust. So I couldn't find any R33 Super GT cars, but let's uh, move straight to the Xanavi Nismo R34 2002 GT500 car. So this is the very last version of the R34 GTR that raced with the RB28. After that, it was a move over to the VQ, which we saw over there with that version of the 34, which looked far more aggressive and more modern in design, but it was able to run that lowered front section because of course it didn't have a straight six, it had a V6 in there. So this is the actual real RB26 powered body, I guess. The Z33s followed and dominated for many years. And during their progression, starting in 2004, they ended up getting really, really aggressive in design. Of course, that blue tinted headlight from 2006 is the one I remember, especially because it's like the last year that I covered Super GT for magazines back in the day. And hearing these things, the backfires on upshifts and downshifts, absolutely crazy. Uh, next door, we go to the FIA GT1 R35. So these are actually V8 powered versions of the R35 raced in the GT1 World Championship in Europe and around the world. And one of these cars is actually uh, part of the Vantec collection. They have another of the JRM racing uh, R35s. So potentially we can actually go to that collection and take a closer look at that car if anybody's interested. So let me know in the comments. So the P11 Primera is actually a very legendary car. Of course, this was raced in the BTCC Championship in the UK. Famous drivers like Aiello used to pilot these things. But the craziest thing is the engine. Okay, the craziest thing about this car is the way that the dry sumped SR20DE sits in the engine bay. You can see how low it is and how far back. But the craziest thing is that they had to put the steering rack like a 90 degree kind of layout in front of the engine because of course there's no other space underneath to put it and a massive airbox fed from the bumper into the ITBs inside there. Absolutely amazing setup. These things develop 300 horsepower from a two liter NA. What makes these cars even cooler is the fact that because you know these tall Gaijin drivers used to be so massive they had to position the driving seat pretty much along with the B pillar and that of course aided in weight distribution and if you check out some footage on these cars on YouTube you'll see that they were so hardly sprung that as soon as they would hit like a, a running strips they would just go on two wheels amazing racing super close racing with those front wheel drive cars next to it GTSR from Australia so next to it is this R31 GTSR, 
which was actually raced in Europe with Wynne Percy from the UK and Alan Grice from Australia at legendary tracks like Spa. And we'll take a big step back into history to kind of chronicle the beginning of you know Nissan's motorsport efforts, starting off with this Gloria S41D Gloria Super 6 that participated in the Japan GP before the Skyline came into the scene. This is the Prince Skyline S54 that I mentioned in the production version that we actually get to see some of these show up at Daikoku meetings and Oktama meets. So it's, uh, it's cool to see the race version, but even cooler to see that there's not much difference from the road going car to these works creations, except maybe half a roll cage, uh, different wheels, and of course, uh, delivery. We progress with the SP310 Fair Lady race car. You see that loop in the back. And then another car that was at Nismo Festival, the R380. So uh, this Prince mid-engined race car was actually a successful race car that participated in the late 60s. And the crazy thing is that the two liter straight six that powered it um, was the engine that kind of led to Nissan creating the S20 that then powered the GTR. So there's a bit of a link with this 380 to the Skyline GTR, uh, starting with the Hakoska and then on to the Ken Mary. And then as things got really competitive, the evolutions of the R380, R3, 81, 82, and 83 ended up kind of evolving exponentially would be one way to explain it, starting off with the straight six, straight six being dropped for a naturally aspirated V8. You can see the carb set up there much bigger cars, much wider, and of course, open cars, no roofs on these. The real change happened um, with the R382 as they moved from a V8 into a massive V12. And it's really cool to see the Nissan branding on the head of a V12 engine. Not much space to take a look back here, but crazy looking things. Look at the oil cooler at the back there. Look at the lines, absolutely crazy looking things. And that kind of progressed from 1969 to 1970 with the R383. So this was an evolution, mainly in uh, aerodynamics, I guess. Uh, as that V12 still sits behind here in a more compact position. You can see the transmission transaxle from Hewland hanging back there. Another beauty that we got to see earlier in the month at Nismo Festival is the race version of the 1973 KPGC 110 Skyline GTR, the Ken Mary. Unfortunately, this beauty never got to race because the oil crisis hit, so Nissan dropped every motorsport initiative it had, but they at least built it, and it's been quite the thing to see when you hit up events like Nismo Festival, and of course, you're lucky enough to come to the Heritage Collection here in Atsugi. We then get to see a couple of Sunnies here from 71 and 72, onto the KPE 10 1973 Cherry Coupe, I always love this car for those crazy, well-integrated over fenders and light covers. It's, uh, I guess, the beginning of them taking a bit of uh, notice and design cues for perfecting aerodynamics. And then over to this generation of the Cherry, the F10 in 1976. We finish up the entire walk with a March race car and the 1973 240ZG race car. So what actually makes this 240ZG race car prototype very special is that it actually ran a LY28. So this is a cross flow head conversion on the L series engine. And it did away with the 2.4 um, for a slightly small stroke up to 2.8 and the cross flow head 
is what allow these cars to be raced in motorsports. But then I thought I should make the end to this video a little bit more dramatic and I asked the guys here at the Heritage Collection if they could pull out one car for me and as ever and I've mentioned this many times before my favorite R34 race car is the Penzo R34 this is the winning car from 1999 the Eris Komas and Satoshi Motoyama raced and it came after the R33 GTR from the year prior in 1998 which was also the winner of the JGTC GT500 championship so very special car and we are actually going to take a little closer look at some of the details Had you told me in 1999 that I'd be able to get a bit of private time with a Penzo GT500 race car, I would have never believed it. And just look at this engine setup. Of course, the RB26 uh, or RB28 in these cars was actually dry sumped, allowing it to be dropped down pretty dramatically in the engine bay. Of course, the suspension turrets are all custom reinforced you can see the steering rack suspended by its own little subframe at the top hanging off the tubular frame that comes up from the chassis and the titanium heat shielding on the turbos turbos of course are repositioned compared to the GT 25 items on the stock car feeding in from the airbox and then to the V mounted intercooler from Calsonic so as you can see, the ducting brings air up from the front grille, up through some oil coolers and then out the hood here. So air management was already on point. And there's even a little intake here that feeds this opening made out of carbon Kevlar that feeds all the way down to that little intake, which brings air into the cabin for the driver. Pretty crazy to see that they actually use the stock ignition coils on these race engines. Uh, that orange color for the cam covers uh, indicates that they're actually magnesium alloy. And you can kind of see the billet subframe that bolts onto the tubular frame and allows all this front section to be bolted on and laid out with the coolers. And as you can see, the driver Eric Comas and Motoyama used to sit pretty much in line with the B-pillar. The carbon fiber repositioned instrument binnacle here has a very simple digital display. And a little center section there where some switches are laid out and the actuator for the sequential. And now you can see why Nismo released those shift knobs in either plastic or titanium. It's because they were used in these GT500 cars. Hydraulic jacks all around, Caro seats, stock R34 mirror, slightly hacked up to be positioned with zip ties, <laughs> and the roll cage. 
look at the back. So for uh, keeping reflections at a minimum from the shiny carbon, they did a bit of a, I guess it's microfiber or some flocking cover. And of course down here we get to see the pedal box. You got some uh, knee pads here for the driver's legs because of course g-forces when you're driving these cars are phenomenal so you got to keep your legs from smashing around and breaking your knees off but yeah pretty cool and what amazing opportunity to see this car